Hey, welcome back to Mobility Project. Yesterday we were talking about pathognomonic cueing and, you know, pain, swelling, decreased range of motion, force production problems as a cue that I'm in a bad position. One of the comments uh, yesterday or today about that journal was saying, hey, can I identify those positions in old sports? Like, maybe it's not just double unders, maybe it's not just the gym. And absolutely, my contention is that it, you absolutely can see the same running problems, the same skating problems, loss of knee position, overextended, go to any local 5K fun run or at the end of a marathon, tune in and watch how people are running, and that's exactly what we're talking about. You can absolutely see these things. The model and our contention is that if you do it correctly in the gym, if you add speed, if you add metabolic demand, if you add actual load and stress, we can compress those tendencies into movements that we tend to see as a training movement anyway. So it's easier to see. Now, one of the questions that came up again after that was, well, what do movement cues, what do we call pathological mechanical cues, what do those look like? So this is a, a conversation to be having. How do we identify it? We spent a lot of time on Mobility Watt talking about the basic principles of movement, how to keep the spine organized, not break the head, you know, the basic positions. Well, let's let's translate that into speed and time. So for, for help, I have a uh, Maybe you know him. His name is Narl Pauli. <laughs> Narls. Narls. This is Carl Pauli of Gymnastics Watt, of course. And because, you know, I, I'm so small and, uh, and, and can do so many pull-ups, I didn't think I'd be a good example. So we, we pull in Carl, and because Carl has spent a lot of time swinging around, and I technically have never been upside down on a bar yet, but it'll happen. Is that what's going to happen today? <laughs> I'm a little scared already. <laughs> you should be scared. But here, here's the deal. So I want to make just a couple lists of, of common problems that we see. Because here's... Here's how you know that people are in bad positions. One, let's just talk about the midline, because we always start here. So one of the first things we see is chicken neck. Chicken neck, and we'll have Carl demonstrate that in a second, which means what? Throw my neck over the bar. That's ugliness, causes all kinds of dysfunction. Two, as soon as I initiate a pull, I break at the thoracic spine. So T-spine lift or rib cage. Fault. In the backswing, I, I get a little excited, maybe don't have my butt on, and instead of creating a global position, Carl talks about so much, I end up having a local position, right? So I have, end up with a little, little bit of a stripperitis as I lift. So we're going to put local extension fault. And what ends up happening is just end up hinging. So those are just some faults along the spine. Well, what ends up happening at the shoulder and the elbow? Well, how about this? Can you lay on the ground, keep your rib cage down, put your arm up without having to bend the elbow? Because this is one of the tests that we see all the time when people are overhead, the elbow's bent. So if I'm hanging on the pull-up rack at full extension and I've got a slightly bent elbow, that tells me something, yeah? Broken. Broken. Hey, Broken. How, many, how many guys do giant swings with bent elbows? Is that possible? I've never seen one. In fact, Carl was like, hey, Kelly, you know what we think about? And I'm just going to paraphrase you for yeah. a second. You were talking about, hey, I should use this as my knee, and I should use this as my hip. Is that right? That's right. So if I'm going to absorb large amounts of force, it shouldn't just be knee. It should be using the hip to absorb the force. That's correct. So if I'm throwing myself back off the bar, I should load the shoulder first, then the elbow? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, of course. Precisely. So we're going to see Carl do that in a second. And Carl was the first guy to point out. He's like, notice that at full compression, those gymnasts are, are fully stacked, right? Yeah. So. We see, now we start to see limb faults. We've got things like bent elbow. Why the hell is your elbow bent when you're trying to be a full extension, right? This is not a powerful motion. As soon as I put that valgus force, that's one of the mechanisms for all the elbow heinousness that we see. No torque in the bottom position. No torque. If you tend one of uh, Carl's freestyle gymnastics, freestyle connection uh, workshops, where it's always talking about how do we express these notions of stability. So let's go over and, and have Carl show us for a second. Come on over. I need to take my clothes off. <laughs> the ratings yeah. just went up. Yes, take your clothes off, please. Pants off too? Can we see? <laughs> Whoa, what's happening? Break your cephalic awesomeness. Now look, so let's demonstrate a few. Let's do the chicken neck first. Things that you look for, and we're, this is not about cueing or uh, this is not about coaching. I want you guys to understand what we see, and we start with the trunk. So Carl jumps up, and the chicken neck. Do you see how he breaks position? Every single time he pulls, head breaks. Every single time, that's a fault. That is a lost position, challenge to spine center. Okay, that's one. I feel like I'm breaching the C-line. <laughs> er. Okay, number two. Show us strictness, and show us the 
<clears throat> cool if you're break. Oh, broken! Oh, that's such a terrible position. And what happens as soon as he breaks and tilts? Do you see how he initiates? He's late on the on the the, the position. Rib cage is up. Scapula doesn't retract. Shoulders go to go to sh crap. I kind of hurt my back. Actually, you all right? Yeah. Okay. You know how? Cracked. Yes. All right. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, turn around and let us see the, the wicked overextension. I don't even know if you can do this. Can you even do this? I'm an expert at everything. <laughs> so as, as Carl swings, there he goes. So he's broken here. Now do a dynamic pull for us. I don't know if I can do that. There he goes. You see how much hinging is just happening? Rib cage is staying flat instead of global extension. Now show us some global extension. Well, now we're seeing better movement through the entire system, not just hinging at the low back. You okay? Don't, don't smoke yourself out. So when we see that scorpion kip, feet on top of the head, that's also a fault, okay? Now, bent arms as we pull, okay? Can you even do that? I don't know. They whipped you in Spain when you were five. The bottom position, elbow stays bent. We see this weird mechanic happening that his elbow at full extension, or in this case full flexion at full elbow extension isn't extended. That's a problem. So we have a load order sequence issue. Um, now here's the big one. When we see elements of the, the butterfly pull-up particularly, or a high rep pull-up iteration, one of the things we're going to do in the next couple, couple days is Carl and I are going to talk about how to kind of reconstitute torque on, in a high rep. So I have to be able to farm torque as I go, right? I can't just drop to the bottom and then spontaneously be stiff again. So what, how are you teaching? Because this, is, I think, is the largest error. What do you yeah. teach? Well, here's the key. I think one of the biggest things is that when you're hanging from the bar, it's not about pulling, it's about pushing. But I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting when Kelly's standing here and showing you this position, all he's saying is how do we kind of farm torque, right? How do we create stability through that external rotation? So the same thing happens in the hang. When I'm hanging, I'm not pulling and create an external rotation. I'm pushing and create an external rotation. That gives me Wait, That's what Mike Bergen tells me to do with my armpit. Are you serious? That's this weird. Same thing, right? So it's almost like human beings so do the same thing. I don't want to pull. I want to think about opening up the armpit or push as you say. I think the example I said is this, is imagine you had you know a strap like this and we want that strap to move fluidly with tension throughout the full range of motion or in the full system. But if I pull my shoulder blade back and down and try to kip, what I'm doing is I'm putting a kink in the system and now there's going to be slack maybe on one side and on the other side there is a lot of tension so the system is completely broken. So what we want to do is create a lot of tension by making the strap stiff all around. So when I'm hanging it's all about pushing and externally rotating. Okay, so I think so that, that's, that's my, my start swing. position. Now, yeah. but I end up to the top, and what I see all the time is that I see athletes hit the top of the pull-up, and then the elbow comes out. Can you? What's happening there? So when you're when you're coming down or at the top? Yeah. The, so I'm kind of just down at the top. As I come down, my elbow comes out. What's well, happening? That's you're losing torque as you're transitioning. So I think one of the things that we talk about a lot too is that where our athletes break and fault is in the transition position. So You mean I'm starting here and now I'm transitioning into another position? Exactly. So you're having to change directions. Changing direction is one of those big pieces that we talk about in fitness, but it happens to be one of our high-level athletic performance things. So what we're losing is that external rotation. So as the elbow caves out, I'm getting into internal rotation in the shoulder and there's no way I can push here. But that's, that's the same thing as if I'm bench pressing with Jesse and, and he, my elbows fly out. Isn't that the same thing? I've lost same torque. Thing. Same thing. So what cue do you do then if I'm at the top and I, and I see elbow fly out? Elbow I, in. Elbow in. What? That's crazy. Isn't that the same position you sort of teach strict muscle up pulling That's in? correct. And rope climb and everything, right? So that elbow in cr is, is the mechanism for creating that torque. And if I see the elbow out, then I just drop, and I'm never going to reconstitute that torque at the bottom, especially when I have to change directions. Right. I have to enter that tunnel thinking about being organized so that I can drop and change directions on a dime. Is that true? That's right. Can you show us what that looks like? Sure. Just regular kipping? Yeah. What are you with a butterfly? But I just want to do, see if you can go elbow out first. We'll do the faulted movement first and then elbow in. Okay. Uh, let me do it from here. Can you reach that? I don't know. Can <laughs> So, faulty. Wait, let's see. There you know, go. Is, that, is that the butterfly? Yeah. The butterfly. There you go. See so how the elbow flies out and down. And that's the, as soon now go elbow in. Show us a better position. At the top of the motion, elbow just comes in a little bit, and it's just the same idea. Instead of as I push away, it's not just push away and let the elbow fly. It's push away to try to create torque. Is there a lack of oxygen here? <laughs> ah. Well, we are at seventeen thousand feet above. 
somewhere. Yeah. Now, here's the deal. One of the things that Carl has really been an advocate of is changing my hand position on the bar. Is that right? Yes, that's, that's true. Now, I like to be here because it just seems like it gives me a lot of room to open up in the back. Yeah. Is that, that's what I'm trying to do. It's just a loosey torque. A loosey torque. But you're asking me to be in a, use a, a false grip or a regular grip, right? Well, here, here's the interesting thing. I think, you know, it's one of those things. What is the optimal position? And yes, it would be nice to have uh, like pseudo false grip. So the key thing that we talk about is, can we get all our knuckles on top of the bar, which would mean get that index finger over, which happens to be, what, extra rotation? Bam! Okay, double hitter. And the second thing is, can we hook grip it? And the hook grip goes thumb on top of index finger and middle finger. And that just gives you a little extra torque thing. So at the bottom, because that, that, that forces that hand to be in a stronger extra rotated position. That's correct. Without me having to reconstitute it all from the bottom. Yes. So I get it from both sides. Yes, but what we see also is that when we do high volume or high rep butterfly pull-ups, we have loss of that, and we actually want to relax a little bit. So it's how much can I get in there and having optimal torque to be able to execute the move without deviating in form, but still, you know, being able to come out on the other side, okay. Okay, so we, we've got some, some basic pathomechanic faults that we've seen on the pull bar. These are the ways that I know an athlete's in a bad position. Yep. This is an athlete, the way that I know we're gonna develop shoulder problems and elbow problems. Without looking at range of motion, this is poor movement. Now, last thing is, a long time ago you were talking about when you see me slip down, what does that mean? You're like, dude, you're, you see athletes re-gripping. What's, what's that mean at the shoulder? Well, at the shoulder, you're basically losing position. Right. So if I'm, we show us real quick. Sure. So if I if I'm tight at the top and I'm I'm pushing, then I'm going to be in a stronger hand position. And if I lose, the hand's going to drop. Here's the thing: you can do it and still drop with the hands, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best place to be. So, but don't, are you, you're telling me that a lot of gymnasts don't tear and shear their hands? Well, they right? they do because they actually spin around the bar, but. We don't ever spin around the bar. So We're just if actually I, if I tear my hinging hands, around the, the wrist. If I have a really bad hand tear, what, is that, what can that tell me? I usually use it as an expression of bad movement. So tearing your hands, expression of bad movement. Why? Because, can you show us why? Yeah. I just go here. That's your position. Good position. And you want to be able to keep that position the whole time. Where the hand so kind of stays still. So if I'm slipping... Ah, oh, you got soft in the yeah. shoulder. Soft in the shoulder every time there's no torque at the bottom. Ah, check. Ah, oh, that was hard. You okay? <laughs> yeah. You just did like seven pull-ups on camera. Yeah. That's legit. Amazing. Don't say he's not legit. He can do uh, feats of strength. Even, even Sometimes. While, even while looking pimp, I'm not going to lie. Um, mobility wad. We'll start uh, compiling some of these ideas. The issue is all of these concepts are there. It's our job as coaches to understand what makes good movement, what makes bad movement, and then coach people out of it. Most of the problems we see are related to position and related to application of that position. And if we clean up the motor control aspect first, it all gets better. I think, you know what, I'm no longer the pocket gymnast, I'm the puppet gymnast. Bam. Bam. See ya. TM.